Hi everyone, in the previous video we saw how to use Rufus to deploy the VMware vSphere ESXi ISO file to a USB pen and we uh, even confirmed that it uh, worked for booting up. So now we have the console here and uh, we've booted up and I'm actually going to start the installation process. Super exciting. So what do we see here? It's going to do an automatic boot. I'll just let it time out here by itself. And uh, there's going to be some processes here that will just naturally take a little bit of time because it has to load all of these various images and so on. And uh, what you might not know about this process here is that actually everything it's loading during this installer is loaded to memory. Now, why is that important? Well, for some of you, you may just boot from the USB pen and then you would want to install to some kind of SD card or some other USB pen perhaps or local disk or something like that and that's fine but what if your plan was to install to a USB pen well then okay you could of course plug that pen in and then uh, use Rufus to put the uh, ISO file on a second USB pen and then boot from that but there's completely no reason to do that it's, it's totally unnecessary it's actually possible to boot from the USB pen just like I'm doing now and then install ESXi onto the very same USB pen because as I already mentioned, the installer is getting loaded into memory. Now that it's uh, basically loaded the whole process, we see ESXi is uh, booting up here. And now I'm fortunate enough here with version 7.0 that the CPUs I'm using on this uh, Fujitsu Primogy server are in fact officially supported. They're on the list of supported uh, CPUs. If this is a uh, home lab where uh, this is your physical server and it doesn't work, uh, then, um, don't despair if the CPU is not necessarily on the supported list. It is possible that it will work regardless, but if it does not work, uh, then you might be out of luck. The good news here though is you could probably install something like 6.5 or 6.7 on the physical host and then still uh, deploy virtual nested ESXi hosts, something I'll cover at a later point. Now, of course, those nested ESXi hosts would be getting the same CPUs as you have on your physical server naturally, but once it's a virtual machine, we could use the CPU ID masking to potentially present it as a different CPU that the nested host would allow. Obviously not something that would be recommended for production workloads, but after all, this is the home lab video series. And uh, if you're basically just setting something up for some demonstration purposes for yourself or for learning purposes, it doesn't really matter. You can completely safely do that. It, it wouldn't crash anything, but uh, not for production workloads, uh, obviously. Now the server here, uh, it's uh, almost up and running. Hopefully there's uh, just a very few things left that it needs to uh, actually uh, run through here. For example, it's checking, do you actually have two CPU cores? Do you actually have four gigs of memory and, and so on? Okay, so here we, we go. First step, basically just say, yeah, I, I wanna kick off the uh, installation here. So we'll press enter. Maybe I have to make sure it's in focus. No, it was. Okay, what else do we have? There's a very long uh, end user license agreement here that we'll uh, obviously have to uh, agree to. So I'm going to agree, press F11 here, uh, continue on. Then it's going to scan through and see what kind of devices does it have that it can install onto. Now this is where if you want to install it onto a disk where for some reason it's not visible, that could be because for example, your disk controller, RAID controller, something, the driver just is not included in ESXi. That's a little bit of a difficult topic. You could bootstrap those drivers in for example, but that's a little bit out of the scope from the video here. Fortunately, I do see my SanDisk USB pen right here, and that is literally what I want to install onto. Okay. Getting some information about the disk. Yeah, I'm okay with overwriting everything. And again, the only reason this works is because we did boot from it, it loaded into memory, and now it's going to be okay. For the uh, lab here, I'm actually going to try and keep it on USD for uh, keyboard, so US English. And uh, although my local keyboard is uh, Danish, so I guess I should pick out a different layout, but I'm not going to do that uh, because I just want to try and keep it as default as possible. We have to put in a password. I'm going to go with a uh, lab password here that I'm just going to be using for the lab here. Hopefully I can get them to match. There we go. Continue on. 
I'll be using the same password throughout the entire lab. So when I'll start building something later on. So here we see that there's some kind of PCI device that's not supported. Could be because there's no driver for it or something like that. What we'll want to notice here is this PCI ID. So you could actually go online and look this up. Uh, I took a quick look and it seems like it's the one um, RAID controller I have inside, which I'm not using anyway, so that's completely fine. I'm just going to ignore this. Obviously, you will want to go and, and look this up. I'll post a link in the description so you can go and see uh, what kind of device was it and uh, how could you potentially look up your own IDs. Okay. Final confirmation here, basically to warn you, you will be destroying everything on this disk. I'm fine with that, so I'm hitting F11 to do the install. And now it's literally wiping the disk and installing everything onto it. And this, of course, can take a few minutes here to uh, complete. Okay, looks like we're getting some progress here. Now, while we wait for this to uh, complete, uh, of course, it's always a good idea to have some sort of idea of what are the next steps. So literally, once we're done here, we'll want to reboot the server again. Uh, that's going to take a very long time. So once we get to that part, I'm going to pause the video. But uh, what could we then do in uh, that time? Well, we could make sure that we already have a good idea of what kind of networking scheme are we going to use here. Uh, probably you have some kind of local home router or something like that that's providing internet connectivity. Maybe it's already giving out DHCP IPs. Great, fantastic. Well, is it using the entire scope, like the entire subnet? Uh, maybe you could bump it up to uh, give it out IPs, uh, let's say larger than .100 at the end, and that will give you a, a lower part of the subnet that you could use. Uh, I already have a little plan here for which IP addresses will I be using for the host, but also the first VM I'll be deploying onto it is going to be a domain controller because I want to have Active Directory running. Then the second one is going to be a VMware vSender. And then we'll have to take in a small assessment. Probably I'll want to have some nested ESXi hosts on top so I can start testing out vMotions and, and things like that. But uh, I think what we'll do here is uh, basically pause the video until the installation here is completed. So the installer is still going and it's uh, about the halfway marker. I'll put the video back on to pause again and we'll come back once it's a little bit more done. So that's basically it. Once we see the counter finish, we see here 7.0.0 has been installed successfully. Great, it will go into eval mode for 60 days. Uh, if you don't have a license and uh, then, well, I guess you have a sort of an issue after 60 days, but there's quite a few ways to get uh, licenses. I, I wouldn't say for free, but uh, through community efforts, you could get that through the vExpert program from VMware, for example, or uh, if you're a member of the VMware user group, they have the so-called VMark Advantage program, where you also get uh, licenses for pretty much any product they have at a very, very advantageous uh, price point. I'll Put a link to that in the description as well. But uh, one thing to note here is that remove installation media before rebooting. Obviously, this is in our example not good advice because I installed to the pen drive that I used to install from. So if I remove it, I'm in a catch 22 situation. There's nothing to boot from. So I'm just going to hit uh, enter here and it's uh, going to start rebooting. Now, uh, keep in mind this is a physical server, not a virtual machine. So that will take quite some time. So what I'll do is I'll pause it again, just so we can see um, that it actually comes up at the end. And here we see the, the actual shutdown, but I'm just gonna pause it for now. All right, so the machine actually got started up and we can see that it's actually going to start booting now. And this is going to look a lot like the process we had when we were doing the initial installation. We see all of the modules getting loaded. Well, honestly, what's happening now is also that it's booting everything into memory. So a common question I get sometimes is, well, what happens if I use a pen drive and this is why I deployed ESXi and it's suddenly broken? Well, that of course is not a great uh, thing to have happen, but don't despair, nothing really serious will happen. Everything will just continue running. You will uh, hopefully get a warning inside ESXi that says, hey, my boot drive has disappeared and you could even have email alerts sent out about that if you have a vSender, for example. But 
the host itself will continue running, the VMs that are living on it, well, they are not living from that pen drive, hopefully, they should be on a real data store with its own separate storage that's still hopefully available. Maybe it's some kind of shared storage or something like that. It's, it's not really important. So they will just continue running. Now I'll pause this again for a second here just while we let all of these different modules load in. Okay, so as you can see, it's finally booted up. Uh, this is basically the first thing that's uh, on the screen. Once it's finished, you see we have two options. I could press F12 and that would prompt me for my username and password. Uh, the default username here, of course, is root. Uh, that's the default built-in super user on a standalone host here. Uh, I don't want to reboot or shut down. The second option is to press F2. If you see the bottom left corner, customize system view logs. I do want to do that. So I'll log in here with my trusty lab password. Here we go. So that takes us to the system customization. This is where you could potentially go and change the root password if you uh, change your mind after the installation. Uh, lockdown mode is grayed out. That's because it's a feature uh, that will be available once we connect the host to a vSender, essentially preventing remote connections directly to the host here. Then we have our management network and um, we have to come up with some kind of naming scheme here. Also the network adapters, you see I'm using just a single NIC right now for the host. Uh, there's multiples available, so I, I could be using those. Uh, right now, I think I'll just leave it for the single one, but um, I, I, why not add the, the second one in as well here. Uh, any VLANs, I'm not using VLANs here. IP version four, yes, it's set to DHCP uh, right now. I don't want to do that. Uh, so what I think I'll do is I'll give it an IP here. And uh, you'll want some kind of IP scheme uh, prepared so already. I'll just give it dot two five four here, or I could even give it something like dot three zero, for example, I think I'll go with three zero. Uh, IPv6, uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, fine. Um, I have IPv6, but I, I, I don't really use it. So I think I'll just leave it for now. DNS, so this is a, a sort of common situation. Uh, right now, this is a new lab I'm setting up. I don't have a local DNS server, but uh, I do have DHCP on my network and it's set to push out some IP addresses. So uh, I don't want it to keep using these forever, but for now, I'll just let it use these and uh, I'll set it to use the following so I can come down and specify the host name. And uh, what are we going to call it? I'm going to call it ESX. Uh, let's see here, layer zero and then dash zero one. So L zero, because this is layer zero, meaning physical hardware. So that kind of helps me when uh, I'm looking at nested virtualization later on. There we go. Now I could add in a custom suffix. Uh, I'm not going to do that right now because I don't have any domain here. Now, if uh, I was done, so we'll say yes to restart the management network. And don't forget, you can always do that. It's uh, completely unintrusive to the virtual machines that are running. Uh, we could do a restart. I'm not doing that. Testing. So testing would be a fantastic idea. So what it's going to do is ping the default gateway, the two DNS servers, and then also try to resolve the host name to check that it points back to the IP address. Now, as mentioned, I don't have a local DNS server yet because this is a completely bare bones setup. So I have to get DNS and so on up and running. So it doesn't make sense to run this test right now. Then we have network restart options. This is literally in the event that you messed up networking and uh, you can't connect to it via the network. So we could go and do some restores here. Keyboard, I picked the US default. If I wanted to change it, I could do it from here. Troubleshooting options. So we have the shell right now. I'm basically at the DCUI, the direct console user interface. Uh, ESXi shell is command prompt from the physical console where I am now. SSH would be remote command line access. Uh, again, I don't want to use this right now. Then we have some shell and SSH timeout. So that's command line timeout. We could even go in and take a peek. So it tells us right here, number of minutes from you log in until you get kicked out if you're idling basically the, the timeout here for idle interactive sessions. So it's infinite right now. Uh, then we have the DCUI timeouts and management agents. Now this is a standalone host. So basically we just have host D running right now, but this could also be the vCenter agent, for example, or maybe the fault domain manager. Okay, let's go back. 
Then we have logs. Uh, you can see I could see the syslog, VM kernel, config, management agent, vCenter agent, VPXA, or the ESXi observation log. And then I can start seeing some support information here. So uh, this is pretty much it for now. The next steps would be to start connecting to this host via either the host client, or uh, if you have it, you could also use VMware Workstation Pro on your computer. But uh, I'll uh, cover that in the next video. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.